Now it's working. Right, let's do some good mornings. Hello, Daisy. Hello, Jazzy and Declan and Aaron and Kieran and Alfred. Hello, and Milo and Rupert and Jasper. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> hello, Alex and Claire and Lucy. Oh, <laughs> it's good to see you all. Um, this morning, I'm in a very beautiful place, as you can see. I'm out here on the steppe with the mountains behind me in the grand country of Kazakhstan. So that's where we're going today. Uh, I'm very well. Thank you, Milo. Thank you for asking. Yes, yes, very well. I've had a bit of a hectic morning trying to sort out all the Zoom links, but now it's all good. OK, so um, let's see if we can find um, our world map to get us started. Where's my button gone? Yes, Declan, Kazakhstan. Here we are. I'll show you it on the map. Here we are. So we're going to Kazakhstan today. Now, some of you may have joined me during, well, it was a few months ago now, uh, where, uh, during lockdown, when we did, well, we started the alphabet of the countries. Um, we went all the way from A to J, and that brings us now to a K. Um, so Kazakhstan is where we are today. Um, a fine country being in the UK. Oh, now my uh, the headphones are going. So you might just be able to see it here. It's a country in Asia. If I zoom in on our map a bit, you can see it here. It's quite a big country in Central Asia. It's right next to China, um, right next to uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, not far from Ch Ch Tajikistan and Turkmenistan and bordering Russia to the north and it very nearly we've got a little tiny connection point almost with Mongolia wouldn't be hard to get there yeah so that's where we are um, a large country with about 16 million people in it which is you know a good amount of people and um, far less than the UK even though the UK is much smaller so we can already tell that because of that it's going to be a bit more open, a bit more natural, a bit more wild, maybe. Um, oh, here we go. Um, <laughs> oh, that's nice, Jesse. Thank you. Um, so uh, where are we here? Let me just try and stop my computer dinging at me. That doesn't help, does it? There we go. Close that. Um, so here's the flag for Kazakhstan as well, which is one of my favorite flags. I really like this one. Um, blue and yellow. We're going to see a lot of blue and yellow. Um, today in lots of our different photos. Um, those are the colours of Kazakhstan. You've got this amazing little, it's kind of like a border, I don't know what this would be called, like a, a pillar maybe? Mm? Um, uh, we figured, <laughs> That's it Declan, yeah, if <laughs> we could fit 33 Englands into the Amazon rainforest, that's very cool. I'm not sure how many you could fit into Kazakhstan, I think a fair few, I'm gonna say at least 10, I reckon, but I haven't done the math so I'm not sure. Um, now, we've also got a great big sun, which always makes people feel good. That's a good thing to have on a flag, isn't it? A nice, happy sun. And then this uh, cool animal, this cool bird under here, which we'll have a look at in a minute. Uh, you might be able to guess what bird that is already, but we will see the, the live version a bit later when we get to the nature section. Mm. So um, if you haven't seen one of these before, what I do is we go through um, the physical geography, so what the country is is made up of, and the landscape and the climate and things like that. Uh, then we have a look at some wildlife. So today it's mainly land animals, but I've got I've got a I've got a bird, got a fish. Yeah. yeah. Um, then we're going to have a look at the government and how this place is run. So who's in charge and what kind of government it has. Um, then we'll look at economics. So the money, is it a rich country or a poor country? All that kind of thing. And then we'll finish off with some culture. We'll look at some uh, sport and some just cool things about the country that really don't fit into any other subject in category, really. Yeah, it does look, as Alfred says, that it looks like the sun is shooting needles. It kind of does. I assume that they're sun rays rather than needles coming out of the sun. That makes the flag mean something quite different. If it was, I, I'd feel sorry for that bird. I'd be like, fly away, bird. The sun is shooting needles at you. Mm. I, I think it's just sun rays, mm. I guess. All right. So let's start with the physical. Let's have a look at a bit more of a detailed map of Kazakhstan here. So here we can see its neighbors. 
and we can see some of the big cities. Um, now, uh, the capital city of Kazakhstan is called Nur Sultan, and it's got a population of just over a million people. So it's a, it's a fair sized city that. Um, uh, but it's not the biggest city in Kazakhstan. It's not the city with the most people. Um, I've circled that one down here. Almaty is the biggest. Um, that has nearly two million people. So it's nearly twice as big as the capital. The capital is the second biggest city. Um, but there are a lot of cities, yes, <laughs> scattered around here. Um, a lot of these are much, much smaller. Um, Almaty and Nursultan are certainly the biggest. Um, but they're, uh, they're pretty... Uh, modern, as we'll see later. Um, they're kind of, they've got cool buildings in them, they've got plenty of, of people. Uh, Nur Sultan holds the government, um, but a lot of sport goes down in Almaty. And because Kazakhstan is such a big country, the temperature, the climate in these two cities is quite different. Um, Almaty is quite a lot warmer the Nur Sultans. Nur Sultan, the more, the further north we go in the northern hemisphere, at least, uh, the closer we get to the North Pole, which is still a long way from here, but the colder it gets. So it makes sense that Nur Sultan is going to be colder than Almaty for sure, because um, there's quite a big distance there. Now, we can also see on this map um, some very big lakes. Usually, lakes don't really show up on big maps like this. You know, if you think of little lakes that we might know of, uh, like in the Lake District, you wouldn't really put the lakes of the Lake District on a map of England, not at this scale, it would look a bit weird, they'd just be little dots. So although the lakes here that we can see, we've got the Aral Sea, we've got uh, Lake Balkash, which is one of the biggest lakes um, in the world, and certainly the biggest one in Kazakhstan, these are huge, yeah, really big. Um, oh, what are the floating sippies in the cities in the top left of a fish pond. I'm so confused. I cannot see any floating cities. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, so huge lakes we have. We also have the Caspian Sea here. So we do have um, a nice bit of coastline, although Caspian Sea is not, I don't think, a true sea. I think it's more like a very, very big uh, lake. Yeah. Um, and the top left. So, oh, these. <laughs> so the other cities that we have around here in the grey areas and in the yellow, the red, the blue and the green, these are cities in different countries. So you can see the capital of Kyrgyzstan, uh, Bishkek, is very close to Almaty. Yeah, but that's a different country. Um, all of these cities up here in the grey, uh, which I think is what Declan is referring to, these are Russian cities. So these are places in Russia. That's why then they're, they're not, it's only the cities in the orange, which are part of Kazakhstan. Yes. Um, and then you can see some really cool names. I wouldn't even know how to pronounce these down in China. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how you would say that. Kuereli? Kuereli? No. Or Wulamulu, Wulumukwi. I don't know. I don't know. Thankfully, we're not doing China. We're doing Kazakhstan. Hooray. Um, so here we have some pictures of the landscape. Um, this one here is what a lot of Kazakhstan looks like. Um, and this is called the steppe. Now, I said, didn't I? I'm here in the steppe. This is the photo that's behind me as well. Um, the step isn't like a flight of stairs steps. That's not how it works. A step is a wide, flat grassland. Um, here, we've got the step, and in the distance, you can see the mountains. But there's something that you might notice is not there, and that's kind of important. Uh, there's no trees. There's no big forests. It's all just grass, flat which means it's difficult for people to live there. Trees are important for people. You know, if you can think of some ways that we use trees. Um, oh, wow, look, uh, <laughs> this is cool. Uh, Beeling's uh, dad is in Almaty right now. That's really cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's very steppy in Almaty. Um, but no, I bet he's having loads of fun. I've got uh, I've got a picture of Almaty later, actually, I think. Mm, that's cool. Um, 
so yeah the step because it doesn't have trees it means that you can't sort of build villages and towns and all that kind of stuff makes it also difficult to stay warm of course because a, a lot of people use wood to light their fires and cook their food and that means that the steppe lands they stay quite empty uh, people tend to not be able to live in them for long or at least not in one place people tend to move around and when we talk about people who move around we call them nomads yeah these are people who who don't settle in one place they just move around with their tents with their animals or their yurts as we often see in, in kazakhstan um and they keep moving so they follow the animals or they take their animals with them they move from water source to water source and if you're doing that if you're dealing with animals and you're moving around you don't need wood so much um you don't need to light your fires with wood you don't need to cook your food with wood because of course you've got all the fuel you need lovely old mm -mm -mm, animal poo oh yeah you get the animal poo you dry it out you use it as logs mm, pretty good ah thank you bleng has got a, a good uh, uh uh where are we uh, a good fact here that Astana is the old name of Nur Sultan. So there you are, the capital used to have a different name, Astana. I believe that was during the time of the uh, uh, of the USSR, which we'll have a look at in a bit. Yeah, thank you, Bilan. That's really good. We have an expert in. I didn't know. You'll be fact checking all my knowledge, won't you? <laughs> all right. Um, now it's not all steps. There's a lot of steps, but it's not all that. So here's a beautiful. Uh, image of one of those Kazakhstan lakes. I like this one. It's a bit of a hazy photo, but I like the way that the mountains are reflecting back off the, off that beautiful blue water. Really nice uh, with the fluffy white clouds. It is. It's very very cool, Declan. Yes. <laughs> ah, look, Bilang has actually been to Kazakhstan. This is amazing. Anyway, you're a true expert. <laughs> um, and here we have. A picture of some traditional homes um, out on the steps. Now these are what we would call yurts. They're a bit like tents. Um, they're nicely domed, usually made out of animal hides, animal skins, um, with a wooden frame. Uh, so they do need to find wood from somewhere for at least <laughs> at least to build these things initially. Um, and the wonderful things about these are that they can be taken down and put back up, and taken down and put back up, so you can move around. You can follow the animals. Um, the reason you couldn't stay in one place with <laughs> the reason you couldn't stay in one place is because um, the grass on the ground, it isn't massively long. Uh, oh, good morning, Noah. Hello. Um, so if you've got a load of animals and often the animals that they'll have in Kazakhstan, we'll see some of them later, but uh, you might have a herd of horses. You might have cattle although that's less common. You might have sheep or goats or even camels. And um, what we have here is if you've got, let's say you've got, I don't know, 20 horses or something, and you just stayed in one space, they'd eat all the grass pretty quick. They'd eat it all, it would go, and then they'd have nothing to eat. So we can't stay still. You've got to keep moving, taking your horses or your cows or whatever animals you've got from one grassy patch to the next grassy patch. Stay there for a few days in your yurt. And then when all the grass is used up, you can put the yurt down and move on again. That's uh, the nomadic style of life. But of course, not everyone uh, in Kazakhstan. In fact, the majority of people in Kazakhstan don't live like that anymore. Um, there are still people that do, but a lot of people live in the modern cities. So this is Nur Sultan here, the, the capital. And you can see just how fancy it is. We've got all these huge high rise buildings with gra glass fronts, not grass fronts. A grass fronted building would be weird. Hmm. Um, we've got um, all these uh, lovely um, sort of decorations. And I'm not sure what this building here is. I couldn't find out. Um, it's quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and of course, all the cars and stuff. So out on the steps, you wouldn't really find much use with these cars. Um, there's no petrol stations out there, so they'd run out of fuel pretty quick. Um, there's the very few roads, so they wouldn't be able to move around very well in the grass, especially if it was got wet and muddy. So you need a horse or a camel out on the steps, whereas in the city, 
horses and camels probably don't do so well you're probably better off with a car so we're looking at a country here with two very different you know styles of living at least um we've got the more traditional nomadic style of living and then you've got the more modern city living yeah um our final picture here shows that it's not all steps there's also great big cliffs and canyons uh, this one reminds me of the usa if you sort of watch your cowboy films and deck then you mentioned cowboys in the uh uh in the uh, chat there uh this does look a bit like a cowboy film doesn't it all these red cliffs like you would see in in america or at least in parts of america oh uh zachariah um where are we today we're in kazakhstan is where we are today kazakhstan um so yeah well we'll keep on going through that here we go now, um, just to give you an idea of the relief of Kazakhstan, if, you, if we have a look at this map here, we can see the height of the different areas. Now, on a map like this, the more brown it is, the higher the land. OK, so we can see that we've got mountains and hills over in the east of the country and the south of the country. So bordering China, border, nearly touching Mongolia up here, we've got our mountain ranges. Um, yes, I'm not sure why there's a weird hole. Yes, uh, <laughs> I don't know it is a weird hole. Um, maybe that's like ah, the bottomless pit. I don't know. I don't think that there exists really. Um, but other, except for these mountains here and a bit, bit of a, a hilly range in the center here or oh, the center of the east i guess most of it's green which means completely flat or this yellowy color which means very low hills so most of the country is steppe yeah um uh, a giant's hole punch yeah maybe yeah it is a weird hole hmm. um so it because it's so flat this is what the landscape looks like a lot of the time. And I like this picture because, well, there's just nothing on the horizon. You know, I, I like the picture behind me with the mountains. That's cool. That must be taken over in the east of the country. But this here, it just shows how big the step is, how far it goes on. Um, when you can look into the distance and see nothing but sky, not a single bump in the landscape. That's yeah, that's pretty impressive. You wouldn't see that in Britain. Um, there's, I don't I can't think of anywhere unless you're actually looking out over the sea, I suppose, then you would see a straight line horizon like this. So it's a pretty special place. And again, not a single tree, nothing, just the grass, uh, which makes it a hard place to live in, even if it's a beautiful place. There we are. Whoop. Bring that down to size again. So Let's take a look. Oh, I found this nice picture as well of a waterfall up in the mountains. That looks pretty epic, doesn't it? Yeah, I like that. Um, but what we're going to do, we're going to compare the climate of Kazakhstan in two different places. Um, one in the north of the country and one in the south of the country. So our north is up here and our second chart, that's this chart here. And then this chart here shows us how warm it is and how wet it is near the Caspian Sea, so down at the bottom here. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's true. Lucy says you would not see a flat uh, horizon out at the sea if the Isle of Wight was in front of you. That's true. Yes, a lot of British coasts you can see the Isle of Wight or France or you know something like that, can't you? That's a good point. Um, so, and um, in the north, up near Russia. In January, we have an average high temperature of minus 12 degrees. Brrr. Oh, Declan's asking what these mean. So <laughs> I should probably say yes. Um, our letters here tell us the month. So January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, and December. There you are. Those are, our, uh, those are each month. And these red bars, they tell us how hot it gets so on average, how hot does it get and how cold does it get? So this is like often this is the daytime temperature and nighttime temperature. OK, so right now in October in northern Kazakhstan, we're looking at it getting down to about freezing and going up to about eight degrees. So it's not massively warm, um, but it gets much colder by December, by Christmas time, even on a good day, it's minus 10. 
that's like really cold. Um, uh, minus 18 at night. In January, it drops down to minus 12 on a good day. Brrr, that is very, very cold indeed. So, and that makes us think of Russia, doesn't it? You know, it makes sense. It's on the border of Russia. Um, there's not much rain at all um, throughout the year in Kazakhstan, but in the north, it gets most rainy when it gets warmest. So a balmy 26 degrees in July, um, which is, you know, that's a, that's a good, good hot day, that is. Um, but down in the south, we can see our numbers all go up. So if we're down the south here next to the Caspian Sea on this, uh, this tip down here, then right now on, on October, it's about 16 degrees which is respectable temperature. You know, that's that's probably what we get on a good sunny day in October uh, in the UK. But in the summer, we go up to 29 on average, which is nice. And it never quite goes down to freezing on a good day in the south, although overnight it can do. It can go down to just below freezing. So it makes a big difference. That tells us how big this country is. Um, in Britain, there isn't much difference. There's a slight difference. But if you went right down to the south to Cornwall and then you went right up to the north and the Orkney Islands, there's a bit of a difference in temperature, but it doesn't change that much. Not as much as this. This changes from minus 12 in January to one in January. That's a big swing. Um, so, yeah, makes a big difference where you are in this country for sure. OK, let's go find some wildlife. Ooh -hoo -hoo. Um. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, oh, I spy a foot. We're nearly there. Here we go. So here's our national animal to start with, the golden eagle. This is the, the one that we saw on the flag. And I like this photo because it kind of it kind of matches. It's not exactly right, but it kind of matches. I like it. Um, we'll see why golden eagles are quite so important a bit later when we get to the culture era section. But the golden eagle is a very noble animal, very big and very, very deadly. They are amazing at hunting and they use their amazing eyesight to be able to see even very small prey down on the ground. And then when they see something, they can strike. Um, they will whip down out of the sky like an arrow and they will grab an animal in their talons. Their claws are incredibly long and incredibly sharp. You would not want one to uh, to grab you, that's for sure. Hello, Explorer Gengar. <laughs> Hi, you've been to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. That's very cool. <laughs> that's excellent. I hope you had a good time. Mm -hmm. Did you see a golden eagle? You might have done if you were lucky. Mm. Um, now, they can also, of course, get their prey with their razor sharp beaks. So there's not much escaping from a golden eagle. Um, there are other countries which have eagles as their national animals or as their national birds. Of course, the most famous being the United States of America with their bald eagle. But the golden eagle is one that, uh, <laughs> Explorer again, I did not see any golden eagles. Ah, well, <laughs> that's a shame. <laughs> Maybe they were, they were flying too high behind the clouds or something. Yeah. Um, but what would the golden eagle be hunting anyway? So there's a few things here one of these, the golden eagle, would not be able to hunt, but the other two it can. Um, out on the plains, we have beautiful birds like this. Um, this is called the great bustard. And I like the coloration. I like the way that it's feathers. They almost look like tiger stripes, don't they? Although it doesn't look quite as scary as a tiger. But these are birds that generally stay on the ground. And a golden eagle, if it saw one, it might... Uh, take a dive and, and catch one of these things. Um, who would win? Oh, that's a good question. Aaron and, and Kieran ask, who would win in a fight between a golden eagle or a bald eagle? I don't know. I quite like, I, th I think I put my money on the golden eagle. I can tell you what, in a fight between the golden eagle of Kazakhstan and the chicken of France, the golden eagle of Kazakhstan would definitely win unless the chicken of France has some kind of, I don't know, special secret weapon hmm, that we don't know about. Um, so another thing out in sort of the more desertous areas, because there are like uh, semi-arid, they call it. So they're areas that are very much like the desert. We would find jaboas. Um, a jaboa is this cute little creature here. Ginormous ears, huge legs and a very long tail. Um, perfect 
for leaping and jumping around. They're very, very fast and very, very cute, yes. Um, but these feet, uh, they kind of move like springs. They kind of boing, boing, boing um, around the landscape. They've got their ears there so they can hear any kind of predator coming that might eat them and then just bounce away. And their tails are used to keep their balance and they can even sort of push off with their tails and help them bounce higher. Um, but of course, they're not so good at fighting. So if the golden eagle catches it, it's goodbye Jaboa, I'm afraid. But thankfully, because they are so fast, uh, they often stay out of the way. The Jaboa also has another um, benefit, shall we say? And that's the fact that it is nocturnal. And the golden eagle isn't nocturnal. So that means that it's very rare that the golden eagle is around at the same time as the Jaboa. The Jaboa hunting and hunting and scavenging at night um, doesn't come into contact with the golden eagle too much yeah. unless of course the jaboa is being naughty and not going to bed on time mm. then the golden eagle will be out there um, now our, our, our animal here of course is one that is not going to be eaten by a golden eagle a golden eagle could try but i don't think it's going to have much leg luck with this great big creature um, oh, does it have two legs or four? Uh, that's a good question. So our, just to go back to our Jaboa. Oh, my screen is frozen. Um, the Jaboa has uh, four little legs, but you would say two legs and two arms, I think. If I zoom in a bit, you can just see its front paw there. Yes, it's a bit of a, again, it's not a great picture, is it? Um, but yes, they can bounce around on those big back legs. Um, so yes, our camel here, these are perfect for steppe living. I mean, you know probably that camels live in deserts, they live in dry places. Um, but often when you see camels in the Sahara Desert or something like that, um, they usually are one humped camels. And they're nowhere near as shaggy, as furry as these ones. The Bactrian camels are much, much hairier. And that's because their landscape is much colder they live in cold desert areas rather than hot desert areas. So if we took one of those classic camels from Saudi Arabia um, or Egypt that you might think of and put them in the steppes of Kazakhstan, they would be too cold. They wouldn't like it. And if we took a Bactrian camel and put it in the Sahara Desert, it would probably just faint because it would be so hot. I mean, think of all that fur. Keep it, it would just it would just melt or something. I don't think it would literally melt. Warning. Um, but so these are camels. And of course, the, the impressive thing about the Bactrian is that it has two humps. Um, can you have Jaboa as pet? I believe so. Yeah, I reckon you could have. I mean, they're not far off from a gerbil, really, are they? Um, so I assume you could get a Jaboa in this country and, or, or from a pet shop, maybe. I don't know. You have to look into it, I guess. Um, be quite, quite fun. <laughs> Explore Gengar's dad is an Almaty. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> Everyone's just hanging around in Kazakhstan at the moment. I'm, I'm quite surprised. <laughs> uh, this is very good. <laughs> All right. So there are, of course, some more vicious creatures that live in Kazakhstan. Here we have some predators. So um, up in the north, especially bordering with Russia, we find the gray wolf. Um, gray wolves, they hunt in packs, um, uh, hunting their prey sometimes for days uh, before cornering them and getting them. Now, I haven't got any pictures here, but on the steps, you do find huge wild herds of like uh, deer or deer like camels, uh, not deer like camels, deer like animals. Uh, there are wild herds of goat and things. And that's the kind of thing that these wolves will hunt. If we go into the uh, forests of the west and the north, you will also find the Eurasian brown bear. Um, this is a great big creature, which of course is also, or can be, quite a frightening adversary. You wouldn't want to fight a bear. The bear would win. It would beat a golden eagle and the chicken of France, even if they teamed up and worked together. Um, <laughs> Alfred suggests maybe we uh, shave the Bactrian camel and put it in the Sahara Desert. I don't think it would like it. I think it, it's used to the cold. That's what it likes. Um, 
<laughs> ah, now Explorer Gengar saying that this is a uh, like a grizzly bear. I think a grizzly bear is slightly different. I'm not sure, but I think grizzly bears get bigger than Eurasian bears, um, although they do look very similar. Yeah, you, the grizzly you generally find in North America, don't you? I think they're a bit bigger. Yeah. Would a tiger beat a bear? Amy, that's a wonderful question. Tiger versus bear. That There's only one way to find out. And that's definitely to Google it. Don't make them fight. That would be cruel. Yeah. Um, I don't know how often tigers and bears uh, meet up. I mean, there are tigers and bears both in Russia, but I don't know if they're in the same areas. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, if the chicken of France had a death ray, Declan, then the chicken of France would defeat all things. Probably. Yes. Um, unless it was in the water, of course, because I found this cool uh, fish here. This is called the snakehead fish. And this is a predatory fish that lives in the water and eats smaller fish. Uh, I like this. I, li I like it because of its name. And you kind of see why it's called the snakehead. Um, it's just a fish, of course, but it does look kind of snaky. Its scales look snaky. It's got that snaky kind of feel to it. So, yeah, there you are. Um, even the water is not safe. I don't think one of these would attack a person, mind you, but they do eat fish. They are predatory fish. Hmm. All right. So plenty of wildlife going on, for sure, um, as you'd expect, because it's a huge country with only, I say only, 16 million people in it, which means that there are huge areas where there are just no humans at all, or at least not humans at all very often. So that means that wildlife can really get on and live its own way and do its own thing. And, you know, it all kind of goes together. Um, and of course, these are just a few of the animals in Kazakhstan. Um, you also get huge packs of wild dogs and things like that. So, yeah, it's kind of a, an interesting place to be. Now, let's go and look. We'll get a bit more serious now. We'll talk about the government. So. As of last year, 2019, uh, Kazakhstan has got two new leaders. Um, it's one of these countries, uh, like a lot of them that we've seen before, uh, Greece, France, etc., that have both a president and a prime minister. Now, the president is a bit more important in this case, though. Often, like in Greece and France, the president doesn't really do anything. They kind of, uh, they're chosen... They you know, do the, the kind of thing that the Queen would do in the UK. They wave a lot and sign things and you know, go out and give speeches and stuff like that. They're important, but they're not quite so important. It's a bit different in Kazakhstan. The president is really very important because every five years there is an election and the people of Kazakhstan get to vote who their president is. Um, this guy here is the current president. Uh, I'm probably going to murder his name here, but I'll try. Kasim Jomart Tokayev is the current president of Kazakhstan. Uh, he was voted in by about 70% of the people, chose him, so he seems to be quite popular. Um, and he's quite powerful. He's in charge of the army, so he decides, you know, what the army does and where it goes and all that kind of stuff. And of course, Kazakhstan is a modern country, so it has... Uh, fighter jets and tanks and you know a proper army going on um so that makes him quite powerful more powerful than a lot of other presidents he also gets to make a lot of the laws and make a lot of the decisions on his own or with the help of his parliament and he gets to choose who the prime minister is so in the uk people vote for who the prime minister is and that's what we choose and then they take on the power in kazakhstan it's kind of the other way around we vote or the people vote for the president, and then the president chooses someone that he would like to be the prime minister who gets on with kind of all the, the tricky work, I guess, the, the, the making things work, work, if that makes sense. Uh, maybe the president will say, I want to do this, and it'll be the prime minister's job to work out how to get that done. Sometimes tricky. Uh -huh. So our prime minister at the moment is Askar Mamin, and both of these, from what I could find on the internet, reading you know, news articles and stuff, both of these seem to be pretty popular um, as of now. I mean, they seem to be good guys. As, you know, I'm not an expert on Kazakhstani politics, of course, but they seem to be fairly popular. So there you go. Now, it wasn't always this way. For many, many years, Kazakhstan was not its own country. Kazakhstan was part of the USSR, um, and the USSR used to be 
one of the most powerful countries on earth, probably the second most powerful country, a communist country um, ruled over from Moscow, which is roughly here in where what we would now call Russia. Now, for many years, uh, the USSR worked as one great big country, but not everyone was happy with that. Um, the people in charge were Russians. And there are a lot of Russians in Kazakhstan. About 20% of the people that live there come from Russia at some point. So, you know, it is a mixed society. Not everyone is traditional Kazakh, which is why, you know, some people look different from others. Um, but, um, yeah, not everyone was happy with the Russians being in charge. So in 1991, when the communist government kind of fell, gave up, however you want to look at it, um, all the other countries around it, or, or parts of what was it, got their independence. So that's in 1991, Kazakhstan became its own country. And they decided straight away, we don't want to be communist anymore. We don't want uh, to be told what to do and uh, like that. Instead, we want our own government. We want to have the people decide. Um, under the USSR, people didn't get to choose who was in charge of the country. Um, the, the Communist Party did. And so sometimes you had good guys and sometimes you had really bad guys and you could never really tell what you were going to get and you couldn't have a, didn't have a say. So the Kazakhstan people, they decided that they would have a say and they would have democracy instead. So now the people get to vote. Um, and I think, as we'll see in a bit, generally speaking, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing that they split away and came up with their own country. Um, there you are. <laughs> uh -huh. So let's have a look at their economics. Let's see where they're doing now. All right. So everyone's favorite point of these lessons now. Everyone loves this. Oh, yes. We're going to have a look at the GDP per capita. Ooh. Now, so far, we've done a lot of countries. Uh, we've gone all the way from Australia for A, all the way down to Japan for J, and now we've got uh, our K with Kazakhstan. And each time, if this is your first one, um, we see, we, we imagine that all the money made in a country by all the different people, so in Kazakhstan's case, the 16 million people, we add it all up, we put it all in a great big pot, and then we divide all that money by the number of people in the country, in this case, 16 million. And that tells us how much money each country has. Okay, so um, in the case of Kazakhstan, we're somewhere near the bottom middle of the pack. It's not the richest country. It's not the poorest country that we've looked at. It's kind of in the middle. But we can definitely see that there are three distinct groups of countries um, that are coming out here. Now, these ones here, Denmark, Australia, the UK, France, Japan, and Greece. These are what we would call developed countries, which means they're quite rich and they're quite modern. They're not all as rich as each other. You'll see that Greece, you know, is, well, it's roughly half as rich as the United Kingdom. So it's not like all of these countries are incredibly rich. And the United Kingdom is about only about two thirds of how, of how rich Denmark is. Denmark is at the top, has been for a while. Um, but these are countries where everything's, yeah, it's a fancy word for rich. That's a good way of looking at it, Declan. Developed, it's a fancy way of looking at rich. Now at the bottom, we only have two of these countries at the moment, but Haiti and Ethiopia, two of the poorest countries in the world. And we call them developing because they are on their way. OK, they're, they're, they're making a start. They're starting to get rich. Um, but really, if developed is a posh way of saying rich, then developing is just a fancy way of saying very poor. Yeah, that's it, Declan. Yeah. Um, so Kazakhstan doesn't fit into either of those groups. It's not a developed country because not everyone in there is, is massively rich. Um, and it's not a developing country because not everyone is massively poor. It's in the middle. Um, it's very similar to China, Brazil and India. Um, India on the, on the sort of downside of this group here. But these countries in the middle, we call them emerging. I kind of think of like a butterfly, I guess. Um, 
we can think of these three levels of development, we call them, these three types of country. The developing country is like the caterpillar. They're on their way. They're getting ready. But at the moment, they're just a, a lumpy caterpillar. That's all they got. Mm -hmm. um, the developed countries are the butterflies. These are the countries that have grown their wings and are now flapping about, showing off, I guess. And emerging countries are those that are somewhere between the two. They are in their cocoon and they're growing and they're growing and they're getting richer and richer. And eventually, of course, and it might not take long, they might burst out as a butterfly unless something goes terribly wrong and they might revert back to a caterpillar. And that's where our metaphor doesn't really work anymore because in real life, a butterfly cannot turn into a caterpillar. I don't think. Hmm. Um, so Kazakhstan is nicely in the middle of our pack here, which means it's not too rich, it's not too poor, it is emerging. Now I just realized I haven't got their GDP per capita number, so let me tell you that. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Where am I gonna find it here? Oh, where have I put it? Da, 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 da. Um, it's very similar to China, so what I'll do is I'll find China's number and that will give you an idea of the GDP per capita. I've got to go all the way back to C. Um, you can't see this happening, but that's what I'm doing. So we're looking at just about 9.8. Oh no, the whole thing crashed. It didn't like me moving around. Hello again, there we go. Uh, let me load that back up for you. Um, so we're looking at around 9.8 thousand uh, dollars per year per person, which, you know, isn't great, I suppose. Um, uh, to give you some idea, uh, in Britain, we're looking at around uh, around three times that. So the average person in the UK earns three times as much, roughly, as the average person in Kazakhstan. Uh, Declan's asking dollars. Why dollars? Because that's the internationally agreed standard for counting money, basically. Um, we use the American dollars because America traditionally, it's maybe changing a bit now, is the richest country. And so they were for a long time in charge of the banks and how money worked. So it's traditional to talk about money in dollars because of course, if we want to compare countries, so if we want to compare, I don't know, Haiti and China and Kazakhstan and Britain and Australia, um, we couldn't just use all their different kinds of money because we'd come up with really different numbers. We have to agree on something that we can share um, some number that will go through. So American dollars is just the way it is, I suppose. That's how we measure these things. Now, I should, well, look, now I'm going out of focus. Hmm, it's one of those days today, people. Here we are, back we are. So Kazakhstan looking at somewhere around $9,000 for the average person in the average year, not massive, but there is some really good news about Kazakhstan, which I can show you on the next uh, diagram here on this graph. Now, back in the year 2002, about 45 percent. So you know, coming up to half of the people in all. Uh, thank you, Alfred. That's, that's good maths. <laughs> um, yeah, we're a little bit higher than that. Uh, Alfred has worked out that we would be 29.4 in England. Um, we're a little bit higher than that, but, you know, roughly three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, back in 2002, 45% of the people in Kazakhstan were what we call living below the poverty line. That means that they didn't have enough money for the basic things that they needed in life. They didn't have enough money for enough food or enough clean water, electricity, a, a proper shelter over their head, whether that's a yurt, a tent or a house. It wasn't great, yeah? But as the years have rolled by, it's got a lot better, getting loads better, in fact. Um, by 2005, we're looking at you know, maybe 33% of people in poverty, not great. But then it starts to drop even more. By 2007, we see we're at about 15% of people in poverty. That means that suddenly 25% of people have gone from being very poor to comfortably well off. So this is a good news story. By the time we get to 2014, we're at just less than 5%. In fact, that means that Kazakhstan is the country that's best to live in, in terms of, you know, poverty or the lack of it, in the whole of Central Asia. It's doing better than Mongolia, doing better than China, doing better than its all its neighbours, except maybe Russia. Um, and so that's really good news. 
uh, Kazakhstan is becoming richer and richer. Now, uh, I was reading some economic articles about Kazakhstan, and there seem to be two opinions. Some economists think that Kazakhstan is just going to keep getting richer and richer and become, you know, the most powerful or one of the most powerful countries in Asia. That's one way it could go. But there were a few uh, writers who were saying we need to be careful because although this is very good that we've gone from 45 to less than 5% of the people being poor, it's because it's happened so fast. Usually when we see lines like this, it takes a lot more time for the people to get rich. You know, if we think about history of different countries in the world and that some people are worried that because this has happened so quickly, it could all sort of collapse and fall down. I hope not. I, and I, I assume not. I think that Kazakhstan is going in the right direction to make itself into a very rich and powerful country, which is, of course, good for all the people because you want to be in a country where you can have uh, clean water, where you can have enough food, where you can have schools and hospitals. And that's what comes with this level of development. Now, a lot of the money that Kazakhstan has got and the way that they've made their country richer comes through oil. And of course, we use oil for a lot of different things. Use it for making petrol to drive cars. We use it for, for creating electricity and things like that. So as long as they've got oil, then hopefully they're going to get richer and richer. Now, we'll come on to culture. Um, uh, the first photos I'm going to show you here are of a very special sport from Kazakhstan, which, um, although it happens in other places, um, they certainly do it with a certain flair in Kazakhstan, and they do it with some amazing animals. So here we go. Here's our first cultural images. Uh, Kazakhstan, they're maybe most famous sport, I don't know. It's maybe not the one that people do the most, but it's the most traditional sport, is eagle hunting. That's not hunting eagles, but hunting with eagles. So these guys, or this guy and this girl here, um, they're out and about and they train and they look after their own golden eagles or something called a steppe eagle. There are different types of eagle around Kazakhstan. And then they use them in competitions to hunt animals. So they might ride out onto the steps on their horses and have a day of seeing who can catch the most rabbits uh, with their eagles. And you can see they wear very traditional clothes. Uh, this guy here, a very furry hat. We're in the east and the north of the country. Um, clothes made out of animal skins to keep that warmth in. Big, thick gloves, because of course, these animals have very long talons, so you need that. And a good fast horse as well, because you're going to have to try and keep up with that eagle. Um, I haven't tried this sport myself, but I'd very much like to. I would love to have a go at uh, hunting with an eagle. I just like a pet eagle, really. I, I can't see anything wrong with that. Yeah. Why can't I have a pet eagle? Uh, maybe one day I will move to Kazakhstan and have a pet eagle. <laughs> um, that's not the only sport, though. Here we are. So Kazakhstan has a lot of sports going on. They've got a quite an impressive football team. Um, I like eagles too, Alex. Yes, I do. Uh, Declan's asking for the galaxy pen. Uh, Declan, if I need to write again, I will definitely use the galaxy pen. Um, uh, so we've got, yeah, that there are some, uh, even though hunting with eagles is probably my favourite Kazakhstan sport, it maybe isn't for everyone, and two of the most sort of popular sports above things like football and cricket of which they, they have national teams of course um, are boxing and wrestling lots of fighting sports and this kind of it brings together a few strands of Kazakhstan's history um, Kazakhstan wrestling in particular has always been quite popular um, going back hundreds of years but also wrestling was very popular in the Soviet Union it's a big you know very popular with Russians too so it makes sense that that would still be one of the most uh, yeah, popular sports I guess. Um, I like this picture here because we see people wrestling outside of this great big yurt um, with all these nice colourful uh, what you call those bunting that's it behind them we've got um people wearing these cool uh i suppose you might call it a gi if it was like uh, 
a martial art, but they're grabbing each other by their clothing and throwing each other other over and trying to catch them. Um, yeah, that's the idea. Ah, Tilly says she has held a golden eagle. That's amazing. Um, did it have really sharp claws and did you have to wear gloves, Tilly? Um, mm, that's cool. I'm very jealous. I've never hold, held a golden eagle. Yeah. Um, Jazzy's asking me to use the rainbow pen. Wow. I've got a rainbow pen and I've got a, 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 a space pen. I, I know where the space pen will fit. I'll try and think of somewhere for the, for the rainbow pen as well. Mm. Ah, yes, they did to wear gloves. Yeah, I guess so. Um, another sport that's really big um, in Kazakhstan is cycling, which is you know quite a modern sport, especially when you do it at a high level. And you can see here's the Kazakhstan or one of the Kazakhstan cycling teams in that beautiful blue and yellow colouring, all racing together. I'm not sure where this photo was taken, but it's some big international uh, racing event. So they're pretty high in the rankings as a country when it comes to cycling. Also gymnastics and uh, uh, those kind of, yeah, gymnastic events. Yeah, those are different gymnastic sports that they, they're very, very good at too. Milo has holding, held an eagle too. Hang on, how has everyone got to hold an eagle except for me? This seems unfair. <laughs> oh, look, Zachariah has sent a golden eagle to catch their prey. Milo's hold, held one, Tilly's held one. I feel like ev Declan hasn't. You and me, Declan. We haven't held eagles, <laughs> nor has Alfred. Okay. <laughs> All right. Not everyone's held an eagle. <laughs> I'd very much like to, though. Jazzy hasn't either. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and nor have you guys. Okay. Uh, well, there you are. Maybe it isn't such a common thing to hold an eagle, but you guys who have are very lucky. Daisy's held an owl. That's cool. I like owls. I, I've definitely stroked an owl, but I don't think I've held one. Hmm. The, the owl I stroked was very soft. Um, and they're, of course, as cute as an owl is, they're almost as scary as a, well, just as scary as a eagle if you're a little jerboa or something. An owl will gobble you up just as much, yeah. And Lucy's held a robin. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. Oh, oh, lots of people have held owls. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Um, unfortunately, owl holding is not a sport. It should be. Um, I don't know. I wonder if people do owl hunting. Probably not, because I guess they, they hunt at night mainly. Hmm. Not sure if it's the same. I haven't heard of anyone ever doing owl hunting. Wow, Milo's brother has held a Komodo dragon. Woo! <laughs> and Niels hold a lot of birds, but nothing as big as an eagle. Okay, that makes sense. Um, now, something else that Kazakhstan is quite, quite famous for is its links to space. Yeah, so during the time of the Soviet Union, the USSR, um, we had in the 19, well, 50s going through to the 60s and 70s, you had the space race. Yeah, um, the space race was where two countries, the USA, America, and the USSR, Russia, um, were really trying hard to be the first people to get into space. Oh dear, Declan cannot hear me. Can, can anyone else, is, can anyone else hear me? Is it still working? Tell you, it's one of those days today. Ooh, maybe, huh? Oh, oh, other people can hear me. Okay, so it might be Declan's problem. Mm, okay, sorry about that, Declan. So during the space race, the two countries were constantly trying to outdo each other. Um, the USSR, Russia, managed to get the first dog into space yeah like other space dog um so that was a win for for russia um ussr also managed to get the first man into space yuri gagarin he was the first one to fly up in, in the, into above the uh, the atmosphere and you know hang around in space for a bit pretty good he orbited the earth um russia ussr also managed to send the first satellite into space sputnik which was like a round metal ball with spikes coming off of it. So, you know, the USSR had a long history of going to space and doing things in space. And it turns out that Kazakhstan is the place where a lot of these missions were launched from. It's, you know, there's something about the area, the wide open land, which makes it perfect for sending rockets up to space. Now, of course, the Americans say that they won the space race. They didn't get the first dog. They didn't get the first man. They didn't get the first satellite but they did get the first people walking on the moon. Mm. So you can decide who won that one, I guess. Um, but 
nowadays, those two countries aren't so much fighting with each other. They're not trying to you know, win the competition to get into space. They've done it. You know, they're, they're, they're more friendly now than they used to be. It was quite a heated competition, I must say. Um, and there's something that floats above the Earth, I should say orbits the Earth, called the ISS, the International Space Station. Here comes the pen. Inter... Ooh, national... Ooh, I shouldn't have written so high up. Space Station. There we go. So the International Space Station, as the name would suggest, is a station in space where people from all different countries can go. Now, if you want to get there, whether you're American or British or Russian or Chinese or whatever, a lot of the time you're going to get there from Kazakhstan. There's the, that's the traditional route up. So it's not just the Kazakhstan people who are going into space to go to the space station. People, if you want to get there from America, you have to go all the way to Kazakhstan and then launch yourself up and well, or get launched up, I should say. And then you get to the International Space Station. And because everyone's sort of much more friendly nowadays than they were during the time of the space race, um, at any one time, you'll find Americans there. Singaporean, why not? I don't know if there's been any Singaporean people on the International Space Station. I know there's only been one British person, I think, uh, so far. Um, it's usually Americans and Russians, but you know they, they often have a mix of other people. I know there have been like Indian people and stuff up there as well. Um, but at any one time, you'll find people from all different countries um, hanging out up there, doing experiments and... Uh, you know, taking photos and readings and things. Um, so it's a really important place for science, for sure. Uh, oh, someone has tried from Singapore. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I don't, I, I don't know the, the sort of national breakdowns of the astronauts, but suffice to say, lots of people get them. Now, there is also another bit of important uh, Kazakhstan history. Oh, well, we might come back to that in a minute, but if we've got time. But... That involves this thing here. This is not cut so good as space uh, uh, flight or international space stations. This is the uh, exploding of an atomic bomb, a nuclear bomb. And during what we call the Cold War, when different countries were experimenting with nuclear weapons, um, the countries, if they wanted to try out a bomb, see how it worked, they had to find somewhere really wide open and empty, or it wouldn't work, would it? You know, you, you couldn't you couldn't let off a bomb. In it does look, yeah, they call it a mushroom cloud, Aaron. Yeah, so when they let these bombs off, they call them mushroom clouds because they do. They look like huge mushrooms that are growing, don't they? Very deadly mushrooms, of course. Um, so you couldn't let off a bomb in a city just to test it. You kill everyone. So they needed wide open spaces. And we know, don't we? Kazakhstan has wide open spaces. So uh, the British and the Americans, we would test our bombs. We would find beautiful tropical islands where no one lived and then explodinate them. It's not good. Um, the French, they would use the Sahara Desert. They would go into somewhere in the desert miles away from anyone and let off these huge bombs uh, and see what they did. And of course, the Russians, they used Kazakhstan. So. Uh, Kazakhstan, as we've said right from the start, it's a wide open country. And we can see this orange area on our map of Kazakhstan here. Um, and if we look at that a bit closer, you can see that this is actually one of the biggest bomb testing sites. Well, that's not very good uh, uh, clarity, is it? But there are three different uh, areas where these bombs would be let off. Um, not far from a city. The people in this city, I'd watch out if I were you. I explodinate kaboom um so yeah the wide open spaces they meant that the russians could test some of the biggest bombs in the world there um now for a long time because once you let off one of these bombs you can't go into the area for years because of the radiation it hurts you um but the russians uh, but the good news is that in kazakhstan now they haven't tested any bombs for a very long time and i think a couple of years ago the kazakhstani government said it was safe to go back into this area so now people can go there um but for years they couldn't just in case they ended up getting sick and, and ill um but now it's all good so kazakhstan 
a wide open space. You might think of it as, you know, uh, quite basic, but it's not. It's got the big cities. It's got huge rockets sending people to space all the time. It was used for testing some deadly weapons. Um, and it's got the golden eagle, of course, which is you know, a cool animal, no matter what you think. <laughs> all right. So I hope after that, you've learned a bit more about Kazakhstan. I'd love, I mean, the people who've got family in Kazakhstan at the minute, I mean, if, if there's anything I missed out, please let me know. I'd love to hear uh, what you know about Kazakhstan too. You might have a bit of uh, a better knowledge than I do, eh? <laughs> but thank you very much. And hopefully I'll see you all next week when we're having a look at another country, this time Liberia in Africa. So a pretty different kettle of fish. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. <laughs>